And thank you for joining the Arizona Commerce Authority Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective for this Tuesday, February 23rd. I'm Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. We'd like to start off these boot camps by first thanking all of our community partners. We could not do these boot camps without their help, support, experience, uh, expertise, and time. So we would love to thank them and recognize them. The Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses work through the COVID crisis and return stronger than ever. Um, as we look at those community partner lists we just saw, uh, you can see that it is a statewide initiative supported by uh, those partners throughout the state. Um, there is also, besides just the boot camp, we have a resource collective part of that, which I will share with you in one moment. So our website for the Small Business Boot Camp is a great tool to have favorited and, and marked to, for easy access. First, on the website, you can register for the upcoming sessions. You went there to register for this session. Um, we have the link to the, boot, to the resource collective on that website. And then we also have all of our previous bootcamp sessions recorded and posted on the website to, to review. So if you missed a session and you wanna go back and watch it, you can take a look at it. You can go through the different weeks and see the different sessions that we've done. If you're looking for something in particular, feel free to reach out to us and we can guide you to which, which week it was done and then share that link with you so you can find the resources you're looking for. Um, over the past 41 weeks, we've done over 125 bootcamp sessions. And so we've got a lot of great information by our community partners. As I mentioned on the, the website, we have our link to our resource collective page. And on our resource collective page, we have the tools and resources provided by our community partners that can help support small businesses during this time. This is just a sample list of some of the guides and resources available. You can see we have unemployment guides, there's safety information, there's restaurant, manufacturing, construction, barbershops, cosmetologists, a lot of great information for the various industries uh, that house small businesses. One of the things we also like to do is share some, some updates uh, that uh, impact the small business community uh, for each session. And just yesterday, the White House announced some updates for the PPP. And so some of the changes for the PPP for under 20 employees uh, are starting tomorrow uh, with additional information coming uh, probably this week from the SBA and from the White House on those changes. But the big change, uh, and we'll have this link and we'll post these links on this page in the chat box so you don't have to try to scramble and write them down. But the big change starting tomorrow is that for two weeks, for 14 days, the PPP program will be exclusively for businesses with 20 employees or less and to focus on making sure the smallest businesses throughout the country get the access to the program that they need. Um, so we're excited about that. With that, we will more than likely be having a special boot, uh, PPP session within the next week or week and a half. So pay attention for that. And we will get the information out about that special session. Additionally, if you're still looking for a PPP and you fall in that group, we have our the PPP Arizona lender list provided by the SBA Arizona office. Um, that link is to the PDF that shows that information. And then we have a link to the rest of the SBA COVID-19 relief options. It's a great website uh, to keep track of with the updated information that they share. Another way to stay informed about the about business resources and information is through our COVID-19 Arizona Business Resource website at azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19. Or if you just go to azcommerce.com, across the top will be a big blue ribbon that says COVID-19 business resources. And you can click on that and you can find business guidance, financial resources, and other great information that we're constantly updating. So some quick uh, review of some of the programs that the ACA offers uh, for small businesses. We have our small business services and we can help navigate with the SBA, uh, help you work with the small business development centers or SBDCs, uh, work with SCORE, which is another no cost uh, program through the SBA. 
we can help with local banking contacts if that's what you're needing um, or answer your licensing questions if you're looking to start a business. Our workforce division can help small businesses that are looking to hire their employees with some of their programs as well as upskilling employees. They have some training programs that, that may apply. And then our Arizona MEP, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, is a nationally recognized program uh, to help manufacturers as they work through their challenges and try to grow and, and stay lean. Additionally, we have our small business checklist, and this is for those businesses that are wanting to ex either expand the product line, move to Arizona, uh, or for those looking to start a business or start a side gig. It's an online interactive resource that helps businesses uh, answer those commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance uh, it, challenges or information for the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, there's lots of things to look at when starting a business, and the small business checklist program helps identify those things to look at and where to go to get those things completed. And then finally, the last uh, website we want to mention is the state's COVID-19 information and resource page, ArizonaTogether.org. A lot of great information, not just business, but uh, all different types of information around COVID-19. So with that, we want to look at a quick mention for this week's sessions. Of course, today is on how distracted driving laws impact your business. And then Thursday is work productivity hacks for small businesses um, with Digitile. And uh, they're one of the Arizona up and coming businesses. It's got a lot of, won a lot of awards and recognition lately. So we're excited to have them with us as well. So with that, we wanna go ahead and turn the time over to Tom Golds and Tony Townsend for today's presentation. Um, Tom works with the National Safety Foundation. They helped get this set up and he's with the Hayes Company as well. Um, we've done a lot of work with the National Safety Foundation in the past and being safe when reopening from COVID. So we're excited, excited to partner with them again today on this session, especially with some of the new changes and distracted driving laws that have gone into effect in Arizona. So with that, Tom, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the time over to you. Okay, thanks, Robert. Just gonna pull up my, my PowerPoint. I wanna thank the Arizona Commerce Commission and uh, the Arizona chapter of the National Safety Council for having uh, Tony and I speak today on, on distracted driving. And, Hopefully you'll find it uh, worthwhile. Before I get into my presentation, um, I'm gonna show you a video and it's from the National Safety Council. And what I want you to focus on is what the, uh, in the video, what they say about uh, hands-free use of phones and also some of the large nuclear type verdicts that are coming down against companies and organizations, just like yours, where the uh, employee, the driver, was following the company's safety, fleet safety policy, and they were follow, following the letter of the law in the state that they're in, but they still uh, had uh, multi, multi-million dollar jury, jury verdicts come down against them. So take a look. Juries all over this country are reacting very strongly to distracted driving cell phone crashes. They're awarding very, very large damage amount. Any employer that does not have an enforced ban on cell phones are putting their company at financial risk. Many distractions exist while driving, but cell phones and in-vehicle technology, even hands-free, are some of the most dangerous because they take the driver's mind off the road. 911, what is your emergency? Hi, I have a semi driver. He just ran okay. over a semi. Okay. Uh, hey, he just ran over a, a man. And um, could you see the driver at all? Or did, yes. Did you see where he was looking or could you tell what he was doing? I would be 90% positive I'm thinking he was on the phone. You think he was on the phone? Yeah. I think he had earpiece in there. He was talking. 
when one of these tragic crashes happen, that indeed the company, from the lowest employee to the highest safety officer in the company, has to answer very hard questions that are impossible to answer effectively. Because indeed, without an enforced ban, the company is left to defend something that's indefensible. Implement a distracted driving policy in your organization to keep your workers and those around them safe behind the wheel. The National Safety Council recommends a distracted driving policy that includes banning use of handheld and hands-free devices while driving, using do not disturb mode or silencing and turning off devices while driving, using phones and electronics only when the vehicle is safely parked, and setting navigation and any other interactive electronics before driving. Put a distraction-free driving policy in place. It's smart business. And most importantly, you're helping your workers get home safe at the end of the day. For more information, visit nsc.org slash safe driving kit. Thank you. Interesting what they had to say about hands-free use. I mean, you know, I've fought in various states for uh, hands-free bills and, and laws to be passed. And uh, we're going to hear from Tony here in Arizona regarding what's been accomplished in, in, in that great state. But, you know, hands-free is not risk-free. And, and as a safety professional, I tell organizations just like yours, um, risk managers, CFOs, CEOs, that, you know, it's better not to use a phone at all in the vehicle. Um, what we found over the last uh, five years or so with the states that have enacted hands-free laws, we've seen about a 15 to 20 percent decrease in, in serious crashes and fatalities associated with distracted driving. And, and we think that's from um, and I'll get into this a little bit more in the presentation, but I, we think that's from a lot of advertising that goes on. Uh, there's commercials, uh, people are talking about it. Um, it's in the news, it's you know, in the media, social media is talking about it, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these uh, different social media platforms and, and people are aware of it. They get hands-free devices, they keep their hands on the wheel, they keep their eyes more uh, focused on the drive and it helps it helps about 15 to 20%, which is good. But as a safety professional, I want to impact that 85 to 80 to 85% of the other folks. And the only way we do that is to put down the phone. You've got a list here of some, some companies that I work with. Cargill Corporation has over 155,000 employees across the globe. They've instituted a cell phone free policy, just like the National Safety Council suggested. And, um, you know, it's for all their executives, all their salespeople in the field, all their uh, heavy truck drivers, tra you know, tractor trailer, DOT, CDL drivers, and everybody in between. And they're a profitable company. They're doing very well, even with that policy in place. I mean, you know, I get the question a lot, how, how, do, we, how do we actually do business 15, 20 years ago before the advent of cell phones? You know, we pulled over at gas stations and used, uh, um, Coin, coin phones, you know, and, and you know, then cars lined up. The uh, Eco Lab. I I sat uh, on an airplane flight next to the uh, national sales director for Eco Lab, and we were talking about distracted driving because that's what I talk about with everybody. And he's going, you know, we we've got a policy that we can't use our cell phones in the car too. And I, and you know, he sounded kind of excited about it. I go. What's the deal? You sound excited about this. You're, you're the national sales director. He goes, yeah, we're saving lives and we're increasing sales and, and revenue. And I go, okay, time out. You know, I'm a safety person. I get the saving lives part, but how are you saving revenue and, and say, you know, making higher revenue and sales? And he goes, because every one of our, our, our salespeople in the field, they put out office messages on their phone saying, um, hey, I, I can't take your call right now. I'm either away from my desk or I'm driving. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I want to be safe, not only for myself, but everybody else on the road, including you and your family and all your workers. You know, their customers reached out to Ecolab and asked them for their 
complete safety policy so they could implement it at their locations. And they saw increased sales and revenue from that. Car, the CEO of Cargill said the same thing. It took them a while to get used to um, setting up their GPS or, or looking at messages while they were parked in a parking lot or in their driveway. But as, you know, as they got accustomed to that, it became part of doing business and, and they, they saw increased sales of that too. Federated Insurance, a large regional insurance company, I testified at the Minnesota Senate with the uh, president of Federated Insurance and he said that over 50% of all of Federated's claims in 2020 were related to distracted driving, 50%. So you'll see statistics in the news that maybe talk about 15% or 10% of all crashes are distracted driving related. There are so, so many crashes that aren't reported as distracted driving. I was in one of them. Somebody rear-ended me and they were on their phone. They admitted to it, but it didn't get written down by the officer as a distracted driving related uh, crash at the time. Cummins Diesel has a policy. Summit Fire Protection has a policy. API Group, a large construction outfit, they've got like 60 operating businesses across the country. They uh, established something called Cell Control at the time, and that uh, has changed its name to True Software over the last couple of years. But it's a hard system. It mounts on the visor or on the windshield of the vehicle, and it blocks the cell signal in, in the vehicle. Very profitable companies. I mean, they, they can do it. Anybody can do it. And I say, are you nervous? If, if I did a poll, well, 90% of people think they're good drivers. But 63% of us use their phone at one time or another when they're driving. And I'll be honest with you, I was one of the worst distracted drivers out there uh, up until about five years ago. And then I stopped cold turkey. And I'll tell you one thing, it was difficult. It was difficult because if you leave your phone on and you have it toned in or vibrate in, while you're driving, your natural reaction is just to look at it because you know what, it might be important. Nothing's more important than your life. Look at pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists. Pedestrian fatalities due to distracted driving and, and motor vehicle crashes are on the rise. They've been higher than they've ever been before. In fact, I was doing a presentation uh, a while back in there uh, before COVID and then when most of my presentations were live and uh, I was, there were a couple of guys in the audience from Hawaii and they said that in Hawaii, there's a ordinance that they have, um, um, if you're a distracted pedestrian, it's a $200 fine for looking at your phone when you cross the street. Cause there's so many tourists there that get killed uh, while they're on their phone and walking around, not paying attention. Bicyclists, same thing. You know, what a pedestrian, a bicyclist doesn't stand a chance against a car where the, the uh, uh, you know, the pedestrian's distracted. I see bicyclists looking at their phone, but then you've got a car, somebody in a car doing the same thing. It can be catastrophic. Same thing with motorcycles. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home of Harley Davidson. I've owned several Harleys and other bikes over the years. Being a biker may, has made me a much better defensive driver because I don't trust anybody. Because you know what, if you get in a crash with a truck or semi, a car on a motorcycle, you don't really stand much of a chance. Bikers have a vested interest in getting this, this, this uh, cell thing under control. You know, cell, cell phones aren't the only distraction, but they're the major distraction that we have uh, seen over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and that's for sure. So my name is Tom Geltz. This is my beautiful daughter, Megan Geltz. Megan was killed by a distracted driver on February 29th, 2016, leap day. 30 years as a safety consultant, I couldn't even save my own daughter. That's why I volunteered to be here this morning with you to talk to you about distracted driving because it's too late for me and my family, but it's not too late for you. You need to start making some choices, some right choices. And it's gonna be difficult. You're gonna have difficult making those choices. You're gonna you're gonna say, well, I'm not gonna use my phone today and see how difficult that is when you're driving.
Megan was a cheerleader. She was a flyer on the cheer team in Hudson, Wisconsin, where I live. Hudson's right on the river that borders Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I work. Her death mattered to a lot of people. It impacted a lot of people, not just my family, but my community, my church, several churches across the country, my employer, and now all of you are being impacted by it. You know who impacted the most? That little girl that Megan's holding right there, that's my granddaughter Paisley, who has to grow up now without a mama because of some stupid distracted driver. Think about that. The next time you wanna look at a text or, or answer your phone and talk while you're driving, think about that. Could you live you, with yourself if you killed people like this? Because people are making that decision every day. We need to wake up. And you know, frankly, during COVID, Things have gotten much worse. Uh, there's a lot, you know, less vehicles on the road. People are speeding more, more now than ever before. We're all distracted with something, you know, be it COVID, be it the elections, be it racial issues, be it our, you know, survival, our family issues, you know, the weather. We're all distracted by that. And that's making an impact on it too. Distracted driving comes in many forms. It's not just the phone. That's the major problem right now that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, the, the advent of the, the smartphone. But uh, there's other things. You could be adjusting the radio or the air conditioning. You could be tending to children that are in the back seat. Um, are you being a good role model for your kids? I'll tell you, I was a terrible, terrible role model for my kids. I thought, you know, I was, I'm a safety consultant. I can do this. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. And I'm lucky that I, myself and, and my other kids are, are alive now because I did, I did some crazy things when, when they were in the back seat. You're talking to Siri, you know, you're talking to Siri or, you know, I get that question all the time. What's the difference between talking to somebody on the phone or Siri or talking to somebody in the vehicle? That's a great question. A lot of times when that other person's in the vehicle, if they're an adult, they're probably another driver they actually help you drive when you're driving down the road. You know, if they see something unfolding, they can point it out to you in case they can maybe see it and you can't. Um, they see something and they, they stop talking. When you're talking to somebody on the phone or talking with Siri, they don't stop talking. They just keep you cognitively distracted. 85% of the problem with distracted driving is that cognitive part. That's why hands-free isn't a a foolproof system because it only helps 15 to 20 percent of all crashes texting at intersections you know people say well you know i only text at intersections or i only look down and answer messages or or uh you know look at my look at my email or, or social media at intersections studies show that once you look down at your phone for two to three seconds at an intersection you look back up it takes you over 20 seconds to reorient yourself 360 degrees around you with what's going on. So when that light, and I know I, I've spent a lot of time in, in the Phoenix area in Arizona, you get these wide eight lane uh, thoroughfares with stoplights. And when those lights turn green and you're, you've got the right of way to go through that intersection, you're always safe to do that, right? Because you have the right of way. Some of the more catastrophic crashes are when we have the right of way, we have the green light, we go through that intersection, we get T-boned by a car coming at 50, 60 miles an hour the other, you know, from the side, one side or the other. You need to be on your game all the time because sooner or later it might happen tomorrow, it might happen today, it might happen a week from now or a year from now. Somebody distracted is gonna come at you while you're a driver, pedestrian, riding your bike, walking around the subdivision, whatever, eating. You know, look at all the fast food places. I used to run into the McDonald's and grab a burger. I'd be going down the road and eating, and then some ketchup gets on my pants, and I'm trying to clean it up. Do you think I'd pull over for that? No. If you give yourself a little bit extra time, 15 minutes to get to your destination, you're not in such a hurry. You can pull off the road, go to the gas station, get some gas, check your messages, get something to eat at a fast food place. It only takes five minutes to do that kind of stuff. And the last bullet point there, number seven, 
you're traveling 55 miles an hour going down the freeway and you look down at a text average text takes about two to five seconds to read and or respond to you're going 55 miles an hour you travel a whole football field with your head down how many people drive 55 on the interstates not very many people are going 70 75 80 you look down for two or three seconds you've actually traveled two football fields with your head down I'm going to show you a video here. There's a truck driver and he's in a semi and he's talking about the dump truck that's next to him. Now the volume isn't very loud on this, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it. It won't be buffering for you. Recording in the windshield of his semi. I was just having a beautiful day listening to the radio and I, uh, I seen that dump truck kind of swerve a little bit back a mile or so, so I kind of knew he was fiddling with something probably. And seconds later. When I knew what was going to happen, but there was nothing I could do about it other than get my truck stopped so I didn't get tangled up in it. I left like 150. Nobody was killed in that crash, but they certainly could have been. And the reason that they weren't was that that dump truck almost came to a complete stop after it hit those vehicles because it was unloaded. If that truck would have been loaded with sand or gravel, it would have plowed through those cars, went right through the semi in front of it and caused significantly more damage and probably multiple fatalities. But that's what happens in distracted driving related crashes. People don't slow down before they hit the pile. You know, I never grew up with a phone. I didn't, you know, I was, I'm too old for that. And, and I, I didn't have that as a distraction when I had other distractions driving, but, I didn't have the phone. So even with the older vehicles and the less technology, you know, if, if there was a slowdown on the freeway and I was a little bit distracted, usually I'd see it and I'd slam on the brakes and I'd slow down, maybe hit the pile at 30 miles an hour. Our vehicles are not designed to crash at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And that's what's happening. People are plowing into that pile at full blast with no brakes and multiple fatalities are occurring all the time, every day across this country. How many important phone calls do you get in a day, in a week, in a year? I've had a cell phone for 20 years. I've gotten one important call. That's when Regions Hospital in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota called me and said, your daughter's been in a crash. You need to come down to the hospital immediately. You know, when I got that call, I was sitting in my living room with my wife. I wasn't even driving. All those other calls that I got when I was driving around, customer calls, my kids' calls, my family, my friends, they weren't more important than my life or everybody else on the road. Why are we taking these calls? Why are we doing Zoom meetings while we're driving down the road? I hope you're, none of you are doing that right now. Why are we going on Facebook and other social media, Instagram, Twitter, when we're, when we're on the road? It's taking videos for that. It's not worth it. 2019, there was 5,333 OSHA fatalities in the United States. 2,122 were transportation related. The highest level ever, 40%, 40% of the OSHA fatalities are transportation. You know, when I, I'd go around to job sites and, and, and plants and work with customers, just like you as a safety consultant, I'd always focus on, you know, the in-plant operations, the construction zone operations not just getting to the construction site or getting to work or driving for work. That's the biggest exposure that we have at work, no doubt. I mean, there's nothing even close. Falls are 800, chemical exposure 600, overdoses 313. There's over 4,000 plus DOT fatalities each year. It's the number one killer of teenagers. Don't you think a lot of those teenagers that are killed on our roads are distracted? They'll, they'll all tell you that they're not using their phones when they're driving. We need to really focus on what the exposures are. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a eye, eye awakening event for, for businesses to see that, you know, and, and even your companies that don't have company vehicles, you know, even your employees that drive back and forth to work, that's the chance 
that's the biggest time that they can get exposed to fatalities. I mean, you don't, we don't want to lose anybody, right? So let's do something about it. Make a change. 2019, there were over 39,000 deaths in the United States due to motor vehicle crashes. That number has hovered right around 40,000 fatalities for five, six years. We saw the first increases in, in fatalities in our country in 2015 and 16. Those are the first increases that we've seen in, in, in um, 53 years. You know, and for 53 years, our death rates on our roads were, were dropping. You know, think about, think about the vehicles that we had back in the 60s, you know, muscle cars and, and, and that, you know, low technology. And then we started integrating, you know, put, put shoulder harnesses in vehicles. We had roll cages built into the superstructure of the vehicles and airbags and all the technology that we have now. And the deaths were going down up until about 2009, where they leveled off for about six years, and, and then they started rising in 2015. You know, in 2008, you know what we had? We had the mass adoption of the smartphone. And that had a direct correlation with our death rates stopped dropping. And the next time you go to a baseball game, you got spring training down in Arizona, but you go to a ball field, the average baseball field holds about 40,000 fans. When you, when you get there and there's a sold out crowd, look around. Because that's all the people that are going to die on our roads every year. You know, when COVID's over, hopefully as soon, we're going to still have these deaths every year. And as a safety professional, that is completely unacceptable. How do we get distracted? I've kind of mentioned this already. Visually, manually, visually taking our eyes off the road, manually taking our hands off the wheel. But it's the cognitive part that is the problem. Where we're our brain is more focused on that phone call than the drive. We could be looking right out the windshield, but if we're, we're, you know, if we're in a heated conversation with a friend or a spouse or a kid or a customer, we're concentrating more on that conversation. We would be thinking about that. I get that way even still with uh, when certain songs come on, I'll hear Pink Floyd or another old band that I used to listen to in high school, high school and college, and I'll It'll drift me back to memories and I'll be thinking about that and, and drive miles and not even know, not even remember what happened. It's called multitasking. People think they can multitask. I can talk on the phone and I can drive at the same time, but you can't. You can't do two things at the same time with 100% efficiency in both tasks. Your brain toggles back and forth between the two tasks and you do them slower and you make mistakes. Usually when I'm doing a live presentation right now, I'll pull somebody out of the audience and I'll have them do a test where they have to recite the alphabet from A to J as fast as they can, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, okay? And then I have them do the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And I time them. It takes about two seconds or less to do both of those tasks. And then I ask them to do them both together. And try this at home with your kids or a friend or a coworker. Try them to do them together concurrently, like 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, 6F, 7J. You know, you got to go slower. You can practice that, but you go slower and you make mistakes. You make mistakes when you're doing the numbers and the alphabet that we learned back in kindergarten. It's no big deal. Those are really simple tasks, by the way. I think most of you can do it. But when you do them together, you make mistakes. When you make mistakes when you're driving, bad things happen. So try that at home. Inattention blindness, looking but not seeing. Um, that's what happens when, when, you're, when you're talking on your cell phone, um, even if it's hands-free or Bluetooth or speakerphone. Um, you're looking out the windshield and you're not really seeing what's out there. Kind of like this, you know, this is a study that was done where the persons were um, actually paying attention. They were driving and uh, they could see the big picture. You could see the bus there. You could see the car making a left-hand turn. You could see down the road. You could see the sidewalk, the dog sitting on the sidewalk. You could see the kids running out the door because they missed the bus. This is what happens when you're hands-free driving or when you got the phone up to your ear. You got tunnel vision. 
If something happens in that little tunnel, maybe you can react to it. But everything else you don't even see. You don't, you're not looking in your mirrors. That's why, you know, you're not looking in your side mirror or rear view mirror. That's why those cars on the freeway, they can they start veering into your lane because they don't even know you're there. They have no idea you're not even there. They're they're talking to a VIP on the phone, you know. Don't interrupt them. They they don't see that bus or that car making a left hand turn. Uh, they don't see anybody running out of the house. There's really nobody running out of the house. They don't see it on the road. They can't. They're not planning the drive. You know, looking down the road adequately. This is probably the most important slide in my presentation. Studies show that just anticipating a Facebook post, a social media, a text, a phone call, releases a chemical in our brain called dopamine. When that happens, it gives us a it's a pleasurable experience. It's a euphoria. It makes us feel good. We all get that. Um, that's why when you hear your phone buzz in or you, you feel it when you're driving, you got to look. If I forget to turn it off or put it on airplane mode and I get a message when I'm driving, I will look at the phone just because it's, a, you know, it's making a noise. Boom, it's making a noise in your vehicle. I won't answer it. I won't look to see who it is. But it, it's a it's enough of a distraction that if somebody slams on their brakes right in front of me at that specific time, something bad might happen. You know, let me give you an example what how this even affects me now. I'm sitting in my last year. I'm sitting in my uh, living room watching a hockey game, and uh, I loaded some pictures of uh, my daughter Megan uh, onto Facebook, and I shared it with my friends. And I put my phone on my knee. I'm watching a hockey game, and my phone was on vibrate and it's buzzing in like every five seconds because I had friends from high school and college and coworkers and family members messaging me saying, you know, that they were praying for me and, and thinking about me right now because February is a rough month for, for me. Um, and I could not wait for to look at those messages. It was making me feel good. That was the dopamine release. How are we going to stop this with our kids? You know, how, I mean, like I said, I, I never had a phone when I was growing up, but how the kids now, I mean, I've got, I've got a couple grandkids and you get the phone out and they're boom, they're, they're like magnets towards it. And they don't even have phones. They, their parents don't even really allow them to use it, but they know what it is already. Give me a quick story. When I, um, my granddaughter Paisley, we get to see her occasionally, and, and she came over to our house when she was about uh, four and a half years old, and um, she uh, she came over, and my wife and I were talking in the in the kitchen, and she uh, my phone was sitting on the kitchen table, and, and all of a sudden Paisley starts holding my hand, and I and I, she's pulling on, and I'm still talking to my wife, not really paying attention to her, and finally I looked down, and she wasn't holding my hand. She had got my phone off the table and she was sticking my thumb on it to unlock it. And when, when you know, when the, my, it's an Apple iPhone, I got, when your phone unlocks, all your apps come up. So when I look down on her, she's holding my phone in, in her hands and all the apps are up. And I go, what are you doing? And she took my phone, ran down the hall, into the bathroom, locked the door. So, you know, she wouldn't let me back in. So I, you know, Papa's got the key to the bathroom. So I go back in the kitchen, the key's in the drawer. I get the key, open the drawer, open the door of the bathroom. And she's in there. And uh, I go, what's going on? And she had put 30 selfies on my phone. That's one of them. They're all still on there, by the way. This is like four years ago. So 30 selfies on my phone at that point, and she was already off the photo app and she was playing a game. And I go, what are you, what, what, what are you doing there? And she goes, well, I'm playing a game, Papa. You got lots of games on here. And this probably doesn't surprise you that a four and a half year old kid would know more about uh, the cell phone than a guy who was owned, this is my business phone. And I've had it, I had it for two years at that point. Um, how are we gonna stop our kids from using their phones when they're driving. You know, people tell me all the time, it's like, you know, maybe kids that age that are, you know, that are in the single digits right now, they might not even have to learn how to drive. We'll have all these autonomous vehicles driving around by then. You know what? I really hope so, because I think those vehicles will be a lot safer than 
than the, all the drivers out there not paying attention. Not, not you guys that are, that are gonna pay attention after this presentation, but everybody else that doesn't hear it because I'll get in my car this afternoon and drive to an appointment and I'll see dozens of people not paying attention in a state that has hands-free law uh, in place. Here we are, hands-free is not risk-free. There's 24 states and, and the District of Columbia that have um, hands-free laws. It helps with visual, manual, and it helps with enforcement. Um, in Wisconsin, we don't, where I live, we don't have a, uh, a hands-free law. We have a texting ban. In construction zones, we can't be using our phone, but we don't have a, uh, 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 a hands-free law. CDL requirements nationwide require CDL drivers to use hands-free device. And um, I'll let Tony talk a little bit about the Arizona laws and some other laws that uh, that we're gonna, you know, I helped get the uh, hands-free law passed in Minnesota. I'm proud of that fact. You know, if we, if we save, you know, 50 lives in the state because of it, wonderful. That's worth it to me. But I wanna get everybody else on board with, without using their phone while they're driving. This is a stop sign that Megan was stopped behind when she was sideswiped by another vehicle. Now we have a cross at that intersection. That's a picture of it right there on the right. You know, you drive by crosses. If you cross crisscross this country, you'll see crosses all over the place on freeways. And I hope that you're not uh, associated with any of those crosses because you don't want to be. My granddaughter Paisley will never have her mother take pictures in our front yard. She'll never be there for Halloween. Fortunately, right now we're having another warm snap here and it's in February. This was 2016 and we had a warm snap there. And uh, that's Paisley. She was three years old at the time of the crash. That's me and Paisley washing Megan's car uh, a couple days before the crash. This is a picture taken from the Minnesota State Highway Patrol Reconstruction Report. The other vehicle was traveling northbound uh, towards the towards where the the uh, all the lights are. He crossed over the center line, went on the shoulder on the other side of the road, went into the ditch on the other side of the road, rode through the ditch for about 80 feet, came upon that secondary road where Megan was stopped at that stop sign waiting for oncoming traffic. He bolted his car, launched his car off of that uh, embankment there that went up to the road, hit my daughter's car about halfway up, her uh, halfway up her door. Her car tipped up on its side. His car went over the top of her car, crossed the, the road into the woods on the other side of the uh, street. His car traveled 347 feet and there were no skid marks at all. That's longer than a football field. They estimated that he hit Megan's car after traveling through all the ditch and everything at 54 miles an hour. Slow down, man. All he had to do was slow down a little bit and she'd be alive right now. That's a 2010 Ford Fusion. They don't make convertibles. That's where my daughter died. And that's where Paisley would have died too, my granddaughter, if she would have been in the car. Fortunately, she wasn't. Megan's buried about a quarter of a mile from where she went to high school. Before we had a monument there, my granddaughter used to play in the dirt like it was a sandbox, not really understanding that that's where her mother is. How do you explain that to a three-year-old? That your mom's, your mama's never coming home. We finally got a monument. What it says underneath Megan's name, Besides her birthday, which was last week, Friday, and February 29th, which is a leap day. So what day is that this year? February 28th or March 1st? It's a dilemma within our family. But it says, loving mother of Paisley May, an unborn baby. Because I should be holding a five-year-old little boy right now and talking to you about this dumb topic. Think about that the next time you want to grab your phone while you're driving. I can't wait to see that little guy someday and I'm gonna see him. So what can you do? Talk to your friends, talk to your family, your loved ones. Tell them about what you heard today. 
I can send out uh, uh, video links for you to see this presentation and have them watch it. Maybe it might change things one person at a time. Demand a cell phone policy, a cell phone free policy from your employer. Just drive. Put your phone on airplane mode. It takes about a second to do that. Um, I do presentations at elementary schools and high schools. I'd be glad to do, I did, I've done a whole bunch of them in the Phoenix, Arizona area, but I've done some around the country as well. So uh, a lot in Wisconsin, Minnesota, but I'm, once COVID's over and we can start traveling more, I'd be glad to go do that or do it virtually. I've done a bunch of virtually since, since we've been doing it. Establish a designated driver. Email or write your representative. Just because you have a law in your state doesn't mean you're done with the distracted driving equation. We have a lot more to, lot more to do. There's various apps that are available. I have a new iPhone app on my phone that blocks calls when I'm driving down the road, but there's different ones. You know, younger generation people like to use apps to block the calls. Some of them reward you with different things if you're, if you're being a good, safe driver. Here's my contact information. If you want to take a picture of it, or uh, these slides will be available afterwards and, and it's uh, also recording. We need to make distracted driving socially unacceptable, just like drunk driving is now. That's my family. That was my family um, before the crash. We went to a football game uh, to watch my son play. This is my family now. My oldest daughter got married. Megan was the maid of honor in the wedding. She was a portrait. My son walked her down the aisle. Don't be a memory or a portrait in your family's life. Make a difference. Do it, don't do it for me, do it for you and the people that love you. Thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Townsend, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her her story. Hi, can you guys see me? Yes, we can see and hear you, Tony. You're good. Awesome. Um, thank you, Tom for sharing your story and um, for all the education that you've provided to everybody here. Um, and thank you to everybody who made this, this possible. Um, my name is Tony Townsend. And as you can see, I'm sitting here in my car. I'm doing this Zoom from my car. I have other responsibilities today. I'm on my way um, after this to a meeting that's about 10 minutes away. So I you know, did the right thing. And um, I can't say that I've always done that, but I did the right thing and I'm doing a Zoom call. I'm parked and um, I'm doing my call from here. But I did want to thank you, Tom, for sharing your heartfelt story and um, for the driving facts and um, forms of distracted driving. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Um, like I said, my name is Tony Townsend. Uh, my son was Clayton Townsend. He, show you a picture of Clayton. I'm not a professional at this either, so please bear with me. This is my son, Clayton Townsend. He was killed on January 8th, 2019 by a distracted driver. Um, he was at work. He had somebody pulled over on the freeway and um, that man admitted to texting and driving. He was doing 65 miles an hour, uh, never hit his brakes, crossed over four lanes on the freeway. Um, and like Tom's situation, he never, never hit his brakes. He was traveling 65 miles an hour. Um, so, I tell you this not to make you feel sorry for me. Um, I've had hundreds, probably thousands of people feel sorry for me. And, and that doesn't bring Clayton back. I tell you this today for you. Um, this is about you. And I want you to think for a minute. I've shown you pictures of Clayton. 
Um, one, this is another picture of, of Clayton and his brothers. I have two other sons. Um, this is a picture of Clayton at his wedding, reading a letter that he wrote to his dad and I, thanking us for all we had done for him in his life. And last but not least, this is a picture of Clayton and his little boy, Brixton. You see in my story, just like Tom's with Megan, there's a little boy who is involved who will never know his dad. And so I want you to take a minute. And I said, this is for you. This isn't for me. Um, this is for you. I want you to think about your Clayton's or, or your Megan's. Um, and I want you to literally just take 10 seconds and think about your son or your daughter, um, your husband, your wife, and, and just make this personal because Tom and I can tell you about our Claytons and about our Megans. And, and yeah, you feel sorry for us because we're all human. But until this is personal, until somebody takes away your Clayton or your Megan, you're not as likely to act. So I'd like you to think just for a minute about a family member that this might happen to you. Like I said, on January 2019, Clayton was killed. He'll always be 26 in my mind and in pictures. Um, shortly after that, I was contacted by um, numerous people. We had in Arizona, they had been trying to get the hands free um, bill passed for many years, for eight years. And as painful as it was, I knew I had to do something. Um, I worked with Brendan Lyons. Kate Brophy McGee, a number of legislatures trying to get this bill passed. Did it happen because of Clayton? No. Was he a platform? He was a police officer killed on duty while protecting the community. Um, and the gentleman who hit him admitted to texting and driving. And you know what he was texting about? He was texting his wife as to what they were gonna be eating for dinner that night. Trying to make a dinner a dinner decision. Were they going to go out? Were they going to be eating at home? Um, he didn't make it home that night, not because he was killed. He wasn't, but he ended up in jail um, overnight and now has manslaughter charges. So if you're a victim or your family member is a victim and they're killed, it impacts your life to a point you never thought it could. But there's also the gentleman who hit my son, he now is being charged with manslaughter. He did not set out leaving work that night to hit and kill an officer, a human being, and he will live with that for the rest of his life. And he's now charged with manslaughter. We don't know the outcome. I don't know how much time he's going to spend in jail. That's not for me to decide. It's for the courts. Um, but his outlook for his life certainly is different than it was the day he left on January 8th to go home and spend it with his two daughters and his wife. His, his life was changed too. So we had the bill passed in Arizona. It was contacted by Channel 12 News. We did, they did a segment, they're doing a segment on how many citations they've given out um, since January of this year. 2000 citations by DPS alone they've given out for distracted driving. Some of that is for texting. Some of it is for whatever else it might be that falls under distracted driving. I was asked by Channel 12 on Sunday when I did um, an interview with them, if I thought that out of those 2000 citations that, they, that just one person's life was saved because they were pulled over for distracted driving. And I didn't even have to think about it. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt out of 2000 people in two months that had been pulled over. Do I think somebody's life was saved because an officer or a DPS trooper pulled them over? I absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt know that 
their lives, somebody's life was saved. Clayton's wasn't, but somebody else's was. So I'll bring this back home. When you get pulled over, I know there's a lot of people who think, oh, it's, you know, it's a pain. I'm getting pulled over for distracted diving. There's a $75 fine, which we're working on. In my opinion, it's far too low. Yes, it is a pain. It is a pain, but it is more of a pain to get a phone call. And it's, it's life, it's life changing. Whether you're making that phone call, telling your wife, I'm in jail, I killed somebody, or you're on the other end, your son has just been killed. So again, make this personal. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I know Tom doesn't want you to feel sorry for him. We've had thousands of people feel sorry for us. It doesn't bring our loved ones back. It doesn't stop the manslaughter charges um, against the person who hit my son. So I'd ask you to make it personal. I'd ask you to take a pledge with me today. It's so easy, you guys, to turn on your phone. There's an app that says, I can't take your call right now. I'm driving. I'll get to you when I can. If it's an emergency, call me. Pull over. Do your Zoom calls like I am. Do your conference calls like I am in a parking lot, in a, in a Starbucks, wherever it might be. But don't do it on the road because, as I've said now for two years, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, you are going to have a crash. If you're driving distracted, you are going to have a crash. It's the extent that it's going to happen. None of us are perfect. We cannot do this. So take a pledge with me today. Turn on your, turn on your phones. Take five minutes after this. Make it home to your loved ones. Avoid being that person who now has a manslaughter charge against them. Um, that's my presentation. I, I thank you for having me, Tom. I thank you for sharing your story. You know, if nothing else, um, do it for do it for people you know. This is Clayton and I at his wedding. He was he'll never be. I'll never have another picture of Clayton past the age of 26. And that breaks my heart. It breaks his brother's heart. Thousands were impacted by his death. I'm sure thousands were impacted by Megan. Don't be that person who impacts thousands of people's lives in a negative way. Be that person who impacts somebody by having them see your message on your phone that you're not going to take that call. I thank you for taking the time to hear my story today. I hope it was impactful to you. Um, and now I guess we're open it up for questions. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please place them in the Q&A box. And uh, we, will, we have a couple minutes we can answer some questions before we wrap up. Um, there is one in there asking about recreational marijuana since it's legal now. Um, marijuana, alcohol, prescription drugs are still a cause for uh, driving under the influence. And you can be, from my understanding, I'm, I'm not a legal expert or a police officer, but uh, you can still be uh, pulled over and arrested for driving under the influence, even with recreational marijuana. I'm not an expert on it either, but uh, I mean, I've been in presentations with other officers who said, I mean, and even legal lawyers that indicated that there's really not a blood alcohol less, uh, test for it, like with alcohol, but they have other ways to determine if that person is is, uh, is on drugs. But one of the other questions that I answered was I do have um, sample distracted driving policies and sample fleet safety policies um, that are free. So, I mean, I can, if you want to email me um, at my business email, tgelps at hayescompanies.com, um, I can send those over to you today or, or later on this week. And, and you, then you can modify them to better fit your, your operations. We have another one in there. Just ask, does anyone know how many states now have statewide cell phone laws? Tom, do you know those stats? Yeah, I think it's 24. It might be 23 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, District, yeah, District of Columbia, you know, Washington, D.C. And uh, there's some other uh, territories of the U.S. that have it too. 
most all states have, you know, uh, a texting ban, but um, not not hands free yet. But we're working on it. There's a lot of states working on it right now. I've got a bill in Wisconsin we're working on, but it just takes a long time. Minnesota, when we passed the law, it took 10 years. I was part of that for the last two years. It was a, it's a, it's a, it's very difficult. Excellent, thanks, Tom. Um, just to note, everybody, um, we're getting short here on time to wrap up, but uh, Lisa posted Tom's email in the chat. So if you're interested in contacting Tom directly, uh, if you open the chat, you can see his email in there. We have that. I want to thank Tom and Tony for coming on and joining us today for the boot camp. And I want to thank every, all the participants uh, for being here today. Uh, we appreciate Tom and Tony for sharing their personal stories. And I want to circle back to the beginning of Tom's presentation. He shared some information about how businesses following their current policies were negatively impacted. And to circle this back to small businesses, as more businesses are doing home deliveries, um, food deliveries, et cetera, or as you get back to work and you're traveling back to an office or traveling for sales, please keep these things in mind. Um, as Tom mentioned, those stats were there that a lot of workplace accidents and injuries occur on the road. Um, more on the road than, than in the other areas of work. So uh, great information as we, we look at uh, our businesses and the change in our business environment in these days. So I want to again thank Tom and thank Tony for their examples and the information that they shared with us. This uh, presentation will be is being recorded and will be posted on our website, our bootcamp website uh, later today along with the slide deck so you can reference those or share them with other people that you want to, to come back and watch this. So we, uh, we appreciate everyone for being here. Um, we thank you for taking your time with, to be with us this morning and we look forward to seeing you on Thursday morning for our next boot camp session. Until then, be safe and, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Robert.